What's going on, everybody? Thank you for popping in. This is my friend, Amanda Thieb, is how we pronounce your name. We talked about it before. So I want to, uh, we're going to get right into kind of the best parts of the podcast because I know not a lot of people listen to the end. So I'm going to announce, I'm going to introduce Amanda here. I have all my notes here per usual. So if you're watching, you're going to see me look at my notes. I want to make sure I get this right. So Amanda deserves a big introduction, but we're going to shorten it. We decided in the beginning. So Amanda is a fitness professional, first of all, of over 30 years. So she has a ton of education um, and experience behind her to share with us. She is an author, a best-selling author on Amazon recently. Uh, we'll talk about her book at the end. And and then she's also a menopause educator. And that is one of the prime reasons I am so honored that she decided to come on and donate her time to talk to us, um, to educate us on all things menopause, perimenopause, and maybe help us out with some actionable steps um, that we can use along the way. So Amanda, thank you so much for coming on. Kind of, we scheduled it, but it's kind of for the moment at the same time. <laughs> we were almost spontaneous for this which is nice because i'm not spontaneous anymore everything's got to be mapped out for me so thanks for having me on pam um we've been connected for quite a long time now i think yeah so um yeah so i'm glad to be here yeah so i i started following her on instagram uh it just she just she has a ton of really uh just really science-backed information and a lot, she cuts through the BS. And you know that I love the, my guests that come on that aren't going to feed us a lot of the lies and false promises. And I have to talk about her book really quick. I want everybody to go get that. That's I've listened to it on audiobook and it is amazing. And she just cuts through the crap and tells us and how it is. Not me. It's not me on audiobook. You think yeah. you're going to get this, this Northeast <laughs> British accent, but you get some random Canadian doing it. I know it that's I... what I signed up for. Was your accent? No. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's people great. Can, people complain all the time, but I released the book during COVID when I wasn't allowed to actually go to Canada. I was living in the US at the time, so there was no other option. So, okay, that's well, that's great. Either way, and I will tell you what, um, I am 42 and I know that I'm in the middle of perimenopause right now. Um, but when I listened to her book, I, I had a little bit of understanding. I'd watched her, followed her uh, before her book came out. And um, I messaged her and said, I am already in tears. And I was in the first like five minutes because I, I could get emotional with that because I felt not alone and I felt not crazy. And I felt like I was like, okay, well, I can relate to this stuff. And there's light at the end of the tunnel and this is so totally normal and we can do this together. So it was so comforting. It was like a big hug from a friend. Like, you know what? From we your got best this? mate. That's what it yeah. should be like, hopefully. That's so thank you. what it felt like. And uh, even though it wasn't your accent, it felt like it was you. <laughs> <laughs> and it really did. It, it makes, it made the whole idea of just kind of transitioning through this and living our life through this. Like it's not a big deal and we can figure this out. So menopause is a, a life phase that we're, we're, if we all live long enough, we will go through. So it's a privilege to go through. What the problem is, is that there's been this lack of conversation around the topic of perimenopause and menopause. Um, and so women are going into this blindsided because they don't know what to expect. And so you nailed it when you said, you know, you read the book and you felt you felt like, I'm not alone going through this. And then if I beef up my knowledge, then I have agency. I have agency over my health. The problem is, is that a lot of women go through this without that. And that's when the problems start. And I know that was my experience. And I was a bit frustrated being in the health and wellness industry like yourself. Actually, I've just sat and worked it out. It's 35 years because I'm 53, wow. um, which is oh my god <laughs> and yeah. um so i've been doing this for a long time and so you expect to have a really good understanding of human physiology but there was sort of like a big gap there and so my experience of per perimenopause was brutal absolutely brutal so yeah. it might be a, it might be a natural life phase for most women obviously the circumstances when women go through it in a different way we can touch on that later but um it doesn't mean it's easy right yeah. and it's cer it certainly isn't easy if you don't know what's happening and you don't recognize yourself and the symptoms feel life altering 
mm-hmm. then the medical professional don't know what they don't know what's happening. And mm-hmm. so for a lot of women, they're left with more questions than answers. And it shouldn't be that way. And so one of the reasons I'm happily advocating for this topic from a patient perspective by the way I never pretend I'm a doctor I never give out medical advice I always just talk about what the current evidence says um but like that's how we that's how we inform and empower women right podcasts like this Pam we -hmm. talk about it we we fill in a few blanks and women go okay I get it now I get what's happening and you know I'm ready to tackle this yeah yeah and I And so I did want to kind of get into your story and maybe we can kind of start there just real briefly kind of um, to get kind of in the nuts and bolts of, of this too. And just kind of like, like overall, and I know you explained this in your book and maybe some people out there is, I mean, I talked to friends of mine that are in their late thirties and I noticed after listening to your book and then doing a little bit more like research, because that gave me comfort to say, okay, well, this is a real thing. Um, I probably was a little perimenopause in my late thirties. And, um, you know, and just so I, I feel like a lot of people even just kind of don't even understand what perimenopause is. Uh, so if you want to explain and even what you you and touch on what you just said about you don't recognize yourself and you're not talking just physically. Um, you're talking, I think, for me, more mentally, uh, not recognizing myself, not being able to get a hold of those emotions and just not understanding why I feel a certain type of way. Uh, so if you want to kind of touch on maybe what is perimenopause, a little bit of your symptoms um, and uh, just kind of go from there. And yeah, into- I think that's um, a really great place to start. And it's interesting because I had I have two boys and my youngest boy I had at 38. Mm. Um, and so when my periods came back, they were only 21 days and I was never on birth control pills. I just didn't do very well on them. And, um, but my, so it, it was just whatever my natural cycle was and it had changed, it had reduced. And every week before my period was due, so every third week, mm-hmm. I used to feel like I was getting the worst cold I'd ever had. I'd be run down, I'd sneeze, I'd get a sore throat and I'd just be exhausted. And I just was like, this is really weird. I don't understand what's going on. And so I just, but they they weren't, that wasn't life altering. That was just new and different. And so I just put, you know, got on with it. But then I sort of really started to struggle when I was 42. So, you know, about where you are now. Yeah. Um, And I'd been to a boxing class and I was feeling good and fit and strong and I felt like I was a good example of what being in your 40s could look like right Mm -hmm. without being smug but just saying you know we've got a lot to give and and I really was um enjoying like the first two years of being 40 and after this particularly hard boxing class I went home and I was beat I was absolutely knackered (laughs) I don't even know how to describe it but you know those times when you work out a little bit too hard and then you really suffer yeah. Like the next the next day and you're just like what did I do it just, I just went too far that's how it felt but I was in my bed and I couldn't get out and every time I went to get out of my bed I lost my vision I fell over I was throwing up and then I started to lose feeling in one side of my body like to the point where my right hand would claw like an old like I felt like like an old woman that was getting arthritis yeah. or something And it was a bit worrying. And I thought, you know what, I've just, I'm run down. I've got some virus. That's all this is. And sure sure enough, a couple of days later, I felt sort of back to normal, but took about five days. Then it happened again. And then again, and it just kept repeating. And so I went to my doctors and I said, I think I've got vertigo. Something really odd's happening. I can't stand up for very long. I lose my balance. I walk into the wall, you know, like things like that. And it's really odd. And he went, don't worry, we'll get this sorted. And then I was in Canada at the time in Toronto. I actually came back and that's where I am now. But I had doctors that listened to me. I had doctors that cared and that wanted to help me. So it wasn't like I was fighting. And I know a lot of women do fighting to be heard. They were all saying, let's get to the bottom of this. So I saw for a two-year period, neurologists, ear, nose, throat doctors. I had MRIs. I had CAT scans. You name it. I had all of these different tests. And every single time, the doctors were like, you know, we recognize that you don't feel very well and you actually don't look very well. I don't, I don't wear sickness well. I always look really terrible. Um, 
but we actually don't know why all your tests are inconclusive there's nothing like glaringly wrong and I, and I was devastated because I was like but I'm not myself like I don't know why I'm not thriving I'm doing everything right I'm eating well I'm exercising as best as I can I also but then also during that two-year period all of that started to catch up on me and I started to retreat and this is where I didn't recognize myself I didn't know I was struggling with depression but that's what it was but at the time I just stopped going out socially I stopped enjoying my family I stopped like I would go to work with my clients and put on a mask and pretend everything was okay and go home and then just sit on the sofa for the rest of the afternoon staring into the abyss wondering how I was going to do the next day it was dreadful absolutely yeah. dreadful um two years later so I'm by 44 at this stage I went to a gynecology appointment about something else and he just said to me is everything okay with you and I started crying and I was like <laughs> no um, and he immediately recognized that I was struggling with perimenopause. Like wow, he said, you know awesome. what? And he was like, yeah, the, you're struggling with migraines, with aura. These are a known symptom. And so I never got a headache, but I would lose all of this feeling and vision and balance and stuff. And he said, and they and they were chronic. Like I, every month I would maybe have five days where I didn't have a migraine. It was never stopped. And he said, and I suspect that you're struggling with depression. We can diagnose that, but I can help you and I'm here for you. And it was just such a relief. Well, it was a relief because I didn't have a brain tumor or wherever my yeah. mind had gone. But then I was really frustrated, Pam, because I just was then left with this anger about not knowing this and I was like so what do you mean perimenopause is that like I've never heard of that word bearing in mind this is over 10 years ago I don't know what this word means why don't I know what it means like and that sort of sent me down this rabbit hole and so for the last eight to ten years I've obviously I've written a book and I have a podcast and I speak to experts but I just started like honing in on all of the experts going tell me everything that we need to know tell me all of the places where the evidence is kept, where all the position statements are from the medical organizations. I want to be able to help women not feel like this. It's absolutely wrong. It's a travesty yeah. that, you know, we have 51% of the population are women, 75% mm -hmm. of the women going through menopause is are gonna have some more than um, up to seven symptoms and you only need one that's shitty to, <laughs> to make yeah. an impact 25 percent of women are gonna have severe life-altering symptoms i felt like that was me and they and perimenopause can last eight to ten years and so we know that perimenopause medically is the time leading up to menopause and it can last like i said eight to ten years it can start in our late 30s it can be symptomatic it can people some women can go through it without any symptoms but i've just told you the stats most women have symptoms yeah. there are treatment options available so you don't have to suffer mm -hmm. and um the time that perimenopause ends is when you don't have your periods anymore for a period of 12 months if you haven't had a menstrual cycle it's a retrospective of course you can look back and go okay i'm in menopause that's when that like perimenopause ends and then you know you have a big party and there's fireworks or whatever <laughs> and then and then anything after that sort of time stamp that one day of being in menopause it's considered to be post menopause and mm. you're or, or, or just menopause or it's sort of a little bit of a um you can use both sort of terms and then you're in that state for the rest of your life you're in a postmenopausal state with these very low levels of hormones sex hormones being your estrogen and progesterone primarily for the rest of your life so what that means though just to sort of round this all up is that you can spend one third of your life in menopause in postmenopause most women like the average age is 81 years that we die the average age of menopause is 51 years, right? Yeah. We spend yeah. most of our adult life um, in some state of menopause, either through yeah. hairy to post. And we yeah. don't know anything about it. Well, well, it's changing. For sure, it's changing. But we don't know. Not enough women know. 
there's still a big gap for sure. Yeah, there is. And I think, you know, uh, you and I are kind of in the online space. And so we kind of have a little access to people that are kind of talking about, I think more so even in the, just the last couple of years, I've noticed Mm -hmm. maybe it has to do with me kind of following more people as well. However, I think there's just a lot more open discussion, um, from people like yourself, that's kind of raised, raising awareness, you know, and there's different, you know, physicians that we both probably follow, um, you know, through the social media, uh, things like that. But when you, listed off all of those symptoms, you know, like you said, when you, you, you went through your first couple of years in your forties and you're like, this isn't that bad. This kind of feels great. Um, mm-hmm. I can recognize, I can, I can relate to that because I can recognize that in myself too. And I, I say to some people, even now I'm like, you know, from 37 to 42, I'm a different person. Um, and you know, and, and I look back and I can see those little gradual changes that you're kind of talking about and you don't realize you're in them until you look on the outside and say, wow, like I was depressed or I really didn't feel that well. And you mentioned a lot of different symptoms that I can think of. I mean, probably 10 women that I know for each of those symptoms that you're talking about in their late thirties and forties as a fitness coach and fitness professional, we often hear about people's ailments. (laughs) And we end up being an everything coach, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's our pleasure, but we get to have all of these conversations with people and also it makes us not feel alone too. Um, but we get to have these discussions and I can think of all of these women that have come talking about that and they'll say, oh, I went to my doctor because I was feeling really dizzy and, you know, I have a really good friend and uh, she's suffering from a lot of migraines. And I had mentioned to her not that long ago, have you ever considered like talking to your doctor, maybe it's perimenopause, she's in her late thirties. And it's just something that you don't think about in those ages and people can go through it. Like you said, 10 years before they actually enter that menopause, you know? So, so I, I, I think that even if we stopped right now, people could get comfort from that one little part of the conversation because there's so many things. And you mentioned how you notice you didn't feel well before the week before your cycle. That is so common. It's so that common. Is so common. And there's a really great um, resource that I would recommend. It's a lady called Nina Kozlov who has an organization called Women Living Better. And she's a researcher. And she just researches stuff to do with perimenopause. And on her board of directors, she has everyone from the North American Menopause Society on there. She's very evidence-based. And one of the things she said to me all along is that women need to start understanding that it's not just that their cycles change. Some women's cycles don't change at all. Some start to get shorter, but some of them will have symptoms that literally don't feel hormonal, like they start to feel like they're getting a cold or like it's almost like, and it does make a ton of sense if you appreciate that during perimenopause, progesterone and estrogen are declining. Mm-hmm. Estrogen declines in this like roller coaster manner. Progesterone just like goes down like a slide over this period of time. And estrogen is part of our immune response, right? And so if we're having these fluctuations and declining levels of estrogen, it's no wonder we sort of are getting these sort of like cold like symptoms. Yeah. Not everyone gets them. I mean, so there's supposed to be 34 symptoms of menopause. Most women will suffer from those symptoms during the perimenopause phase, a little bit into postmenopause, and then they usually sort of die off into postmenopause. You know, your body finds like an equilibrium and it can sort of like rejuvenate. And most women in postmenopause in the three to five year window feel good. Like I'm five years out and I feel back to normal and I never thought I would. And I think it's really important to give women that light at the end of the tunnel, as you said. Um, But if we know that there's 34 more symptoms likely to be a few more, I would suspect, um, and a lot of them don't feel hormonal, it can sure. be very empowering for a woman, to, a woman to know. Because estrogen receptors, which are the receivers of any of our messengers, chemical messengers from our hormones, there's about um, estrogen receptors on almost 200 systems in the body. And so that means our brain is impacted, our heart, our joints, our gut, you know, like you name it, estrogen receptors are likely to be there. And so that's why the symptoms don't feel 
hormonal hormonal sure yeah, yeah. and it makes complete sense um i think if you think of it like like that standpoint and that's that's what i think i love about what you're doing in the space and again you're kind of paving a little way for us to even even if it's just to say recognize that it is something and people start to educate themselves and to say this is something you know we're very fortunate to have people like you that are here um doing it for us because i think i i heard in your book on a couple other podcasts that, that i listened to you on and you sort of said you know a, there's a whole bunch of women behind you and us that really had to suffer um and just be confused about the whole thing. And I love the part you talked about the immune system, because I think that's one of the number one things that I hear from my kind of my girlfriend circle. They're like, oh, I feel like I'm getting my kids cold again. You know, I always feel like I'm getting a cold and it's always, you know, right before my period, like then I get my period. And then, and then, so you kind of feel lousy for like these two weeks out of a month. And it's that's just always, relentless. It's like, come on. And and it's like, frustrating as well. Yeah, it's frustrating as well when you're someone that really tries to take charge of their health. Yes, yes. Okay, and and, I, and that, that's one of the things I was going to say. One of the feelings that I had during this time and when I spoke to the people in my community that seems a similar sort of thing is it felt like my body was re like rejecting me or like yeah. I'd, I'd be like, how is it that I've invested all these years of time and energy and education and my body just is like, no, screw you. I'm just going to make you feel terrible. It didn't make any sense to me at all. And obviously it makes sense now when you, the more information you have, the, you know, the better choices. And for me, the, one of the key, the, the two key elements we've already spoke about is the community side. You have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable it is because you're going to always help somebody else without a doubt. It's why I don't mind doing podcasts. I do loads of them because if I just reach one more person yeah. and help that woman understand, then that's a win for me. So you've got the community filling that knowledge gap. And then if, if and when you're in a position where you want to do something about it, you get choice and that choice can be to do medical intervention, non-medical intervention, like, you know, supplements if you want, I don't care, but looking at lifestyle choices and what you can do to support your body. And so there's, there's a number of different ways to skin this cat, right? Yeah. It doesn't always yeah. have to be hormones. Hormones are an important part of the conversation though, but, you know, it's not menopause doesn't equal hormone therapy menopause yeah. is a life phase that we're going to go through and you don't need to suffer that's my underlying message that's the bottom line yeah, yeah. that's the bottom line and uh, i'm kind of glad you brought up like how to kind of mitigate those things like of course you need the community we need to talk about it we need to make it feel normal and i i've listened you know to your book and other podcasts and interviews that you have done. And I love that you talk to your sons about it. And I remember you saying like your son would say something like, don't talk about menopause, like while well, his friends are there or something. Um, and I mean, I have a 10 year old son and he knows what menopause is, you know, and it's not, I don't make a big deal about it, but I, you know, if it comes up in conversation or if I'm talking about it with my husband, um, which I do think the guys need to be educated too, because yes. this when you're married, it's, you know, it's, it's your thing. It's, it's everybody's, you know, a family and we're all, Oh, it's everybody's menopause. Yes. It's definitely. And, and in fact, you know, I did, you mentioned I did a TEDx talk and it's called mm -hmm. should men talk about menopause? Um, oh. And the answer of course is yes, we need yeah. allies. But one of the reasons I did this is because after that doctor's visit where he told me I was in perimenopause, I went to meet my husband for lunch. And he's very much the type that he wants to do nice things with me, always has. He's super supportive of me, but he couldn't help me. When he saw that I was struggling yeah. and he couldn't help me. And I met him and he said, so how did it go? And I was like, well, apparently I'm in perimenopause and I've got depression and migraines. <laughs> and he went, oh, thank God for that. He said, I thought you were going to leave me. Oh. And I just broke my heart a little bit. And I was like, oh, my God. And he, I just thought he's really struggled through this and my kids have really struggled and I've pulled away from work opportunities and I've pulled away from my friends and I've lied about stuff because I didn't want to I was too embarrassed to admit stuff enough it was literally at that time then I was like this is going to change this is yeah. not how I'm going to go forward with this and especially when it came to the depression and the mental health side it was really important that I was open about that 
because yeah. that, that stigma has to go. Sure. And, and, you know, and, and so the, the, the men do struggle because I think that's kind of, that's probably a pretty, I would say common assumption amongst, amongst a lot of men, at least that I know they, they want to fix a problem. And if they can't help, then, you know, we got to kind of give them ways. So that's another reason I have, you know, told my husband, Hey, listen to this audiobook, your audiobook, or, you know, there's a couple other ones that I'm like, cause, cause he, he trains women. He works with women. They're all over 35. I said, this might be going on. Like this is helpful information for you to understand yeah. and in our own relationship. Uh, and I have snapped on my kids and I have said, you know, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, and we talk about perimenopause very little, so they can digestible information. Uh, but so they can understand like, Hey, we all go through things but we got this i'm gonna you know help you figure this out and help me figure it out yeah and it's just making it not a word that you're embarrassed about yeah. right? so is, like i have two like, boys who are 16 and 20 one of them was in a school class when we were in the u.s and it was a um psychology class and the the question to the class was what brain changes happen to a woman between the ages of 45 and 55 that might impact anxiety and depression and how that was the question wow. and yeah. nobody knew and my son put his head down and his hand up at the same time and <laughs> Zoc said oh god here we go anyway it's menopause <laughs> knew it was menopause he's been like my sounding board he's the one that likes to talk things through with me and he the teacher was like oh yeah how did you know that type of thing yeah, I mean, awesome. and, and, and I just think that you know um more Almost every single time I've spoken to a man about this, whether it's in the workplace, because I do a lot of workplace talks or, you know, just in general conversation, men want to be allies. I think there is that innate part of their brain that, like yes. you said, they're fixers. They don't yep. want stuff to be broken. They want to fix it They, you know, and if they can't fix this, which they can't they feel lost they don't know what to say they're walking on eggshells and then if you have this open dialogue and just go you know today's not a good day for me I need your support you know you're going to do the dinner you're going to empty the dishwasher or whatever it takes I can't parent or be a wife today yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, they you only get one <laughs> yeah today. they they want that they want yeah. that to support you and mm -hmm. that's that's my experience and I think that we're just loosening the taboos and the stigma around a word that shouldn't have stigma around it essentially right yeah I I agree and I love it and and I'm I am exactly like you I like to talk about things that I don't think should be a big deal and it's just part of life and and at least if I can give my husband that warning like hey it's not a good day you know I you can do these few things for me uh, and it gives them kind of that that part of the 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 mission with you and gives yeah, them a yeah. job to help with and you know not even if it's just physical job but it's just hey I, I just need a little bit of space today or my husband will say you know what just go to the gym or go for a walk or you know what have you uh so it's 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 those little things that do that do kind of help us um and it's really good for your relationship as well whether your relationship's with a man or a woman it doesn't matter this open conversation has been super helpful for me because mm -hmm. and him he had two years wondering what the hell was going on with our marriage <laughs> and saying to me is it me and i'm like yeah it might be I don't yeah. know. Yeah, because you don't know. I yeah. didn't know. And um, and then now we're in this position where, you know, we had to talk about sex. That all changed, you know, like I had to talk about my dry vagina, like and what yeah. sex looks like and my maybe lack of desire and how I need to change what, you know, an intimate relationship looks like with him. And all of that is so much easier when you have an open dialogue and you know it's really funny I do write about that a little bit in the book and I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination it's a work in progress and I'm very honest about that but my son's um friend he only has like one or two friends it's very like private my son um the 20 year old his friend came around and saw a picture of my book and my book looks like just a fitness book because I'm tense in my muscles and I'm screaming yeah. on the front of the cover and he went oh that's so cool your mom wrote a book and he flicked it open and he went <laughs> but she's got a dry vagina and sex with your dad's not great <laughs> and, my, and my my oldest son was like mom please oh, well. don't there you have it. He <laughs> said, I had one friend. <laughs> and you had to open to that part of the book. 
Oh, That's well. so funny. But you're right. I mean, it, it is something that we can talk about. It shouldn't be such a stigma um, behind it. So I love that you're kind of going through that and kind of helping other people kind of advocate for themselves too um, and to go to your doctor. So I kind of wanted to get into some of the things that you did. You talked real briefly about the mental health. I know you talked a little about it in your book a little, but if you want to share like a couple of the things that you did to help you maybe medically and then also, um, you know, lifestyle that you did to change because you're like me and so many others um, that are going to listen to this, my small community of people that are in fitness and we take care of ourselves, you know, for the most part, at least we're interested in taking care of ourselves and we feel like we have it under control, but then you don't. So what are some suggestions and some things that you have tried um, lifestyle and medical interventions that maybe worked and didn't work or that you've seen in your own community? Work. Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, mm. that you really nailed it when you said we feel like we have it under control because <laughs> we're in that world, right? And I remember one of my friends who was a menopause doctor going to a yoga summit and talking about menopause. And then in the break, they were all like sat there going, well, I'll never go through any of that because I do my yoga every day. And she's like, yeah, you're not going to green smoothie your way out of this, darling. And 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 sort of that's true, right? And I think it's really important to say that, you know, there's so much comes into play when it comes to your unique menopause experience. Some women drink and smoke and never exercise and sail through perimenopause, and other people are super fit and healthy and have a terrible time, right? You just don't know. It does, it, lifestyle does play a part in it for sure, um, but genetics play a massive part, our environment, everything, right? And so if you're someone who's absolutely stressed to the hilt at work with their relationships, with aging parents, with young children, and you're living in this chronic stressed state, you're probably going to have a worse experience through perimenopause because all symptoms are exacerbated by, you know, in, increased stress. And also our stress response changes as estrogen declines. And so regardless, right, whatever your experience is going through menopause, if you're in a place where you're suffering and it doesn't feel good and you you have the knowledge and then you have a doctor that actually is trained because remember doctors don't get training in menopause and even yeah. OBGYNs like one in 10 get training in the USA it's shocking wow. try and hunt yeah. down a menopause specialist if you can and there's ways to do that and then speak about what your options are so the menopause societies recommend hormone therapy as first-line treatment for perimenopause and, and menopause symptoms, right? Um, that are vasomotor symptoms. So vasomotor symptoms are your hot flashes, night sweats, and cold sweats. That's a, like another thing. Um, also, um, if you are you go into menopause early, like under the age of 40 or even sometimes a bit later, 45, it can be helpful for bone health mm. um, up to the age of 51, which is the average age of menopause. It can be helpful for vaginal symptoms of menopause and they're real and they're progressive. They tend not to get better. You have to do stuff to do to anything below the belt. It's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then what it can have is some... Um, sort of um, uh, um, secondary benefits to other symptoms. Now, it's not, they don't issue them based on other symptoms, but women often find that, you know, they just generally feel less fatigued. And the fatigue that hits women in menopause is a real thing. Estrogen controls our energy center in the brain, right? So there's a, there's a ton of symptoms and it may benefit them, but those are the ones it's indicated for. And so, that's the best medicine we have and it's very safe for almost all women but it is contraindicated for some women and it's contraindicated if you've ever had severe blood clot blood clots even the transdermal it's not recommended by the menopause society even though that's considered to be a lot safer it doesn't go through the liver you know it goes straight into the bloodstream that really is a conversation you have to have with your medical provider if you're a breast cancer survivor, there may be a contraindication there, like any type of estrogen-fueled cancer. Um, and then there's also people like me, like the estrogen-sensitive women who try hormone therapy because they're struggling, but it makes them feel worse, considerably yeah. worse, like to the point where my symptoms were so bad, I didn't want to carry on, you know? And so oh, yeah. I think that it's really important to know that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. 
Mm -hmm. Usually when women go on hormone therapy and it's successful and they feel good, there can be potential health benefits from it as well Um, because you are at risk as you go into postmenopause of um, some um, diseases, right? And unless your lifestyle's on track, you know, um, you need um, menopause hormone therapy can sort of aid with some of, there's some of the benefits it can help with. But you can't go on that because you want the health benefits. You know, you can't say, oh, there's nothing wrong with me, but I want to go on hormone therapy because I've heard that the benefits are good. The benefits of exercise and nutrition are better, by the way, than any of that. And we yeah. have the data to show that. But try hormone therapy if it's for you. And if it's not for you, there are non-hormonal pharmaceuticals and there's loads of them and there's new ones coming out all the time so any woman who feels like she's being ignored in the conversation because hormone therapy gets all of the news Mm -hmm. um know that there are other options and they're out there and there's a list of medications that you can take to your doctor to have the conversation about like so for me ultimately i went on an antidepressant for a few years that helped me with my depression obviously and also helped me with my migraines Um, And then I came off them when they got better, right? You know, like, so it was a medication in that respect. Um, Supplements. When you say say hormone therapy, is that, so that's estrogen. Is that, is that what you're? Yes. So, so hormone therapy, um, there was, there's old types of hormone therapy you can get that's oral. um, So Mm -hmm. tablets, but the recommended type of hormone therapy that um, women should take is estrogen transdermally and transdermal means it just goes through the skin and you can get that in a spray and in a patch and in a gel there's lots of different formulations if you still have your uterus if you're a woman who hasn't had to have a hysterectomy yet you need to have progesterone to go with that because estrogen is an anabolic hormone it builds it grows And if you think about when you had your period, you would have high levels of estrogen and it would make the lining of your womb thick Mm -hmm. and then you'd have a period and it would shed, right? Well, um, the the progesterone is to stop the buildup. And if you take um, estrogen and you've got a uterus and you don't take progesterone, then you're at higher risk of uterine cancer. So just don't make that, take that risk at all. Um, A lot of doctors are educated on that. No, it's really hard to get doctors that are educated, but the information is available, right? And um, if you, any, anyone wants to go to my website, there's um, loads of resources on there, just my name, amandatheeb.com. I've tried to collate all of information, but yeah, you do need to have progesterone to go with it for just for safety. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, I get why the conversation about hormone therapy is like on fire at the moment because there's still not many women take it right they still think that it's not safe um there i think that so the zealots out there and there's a lot of celebrity doctors are like hormones Mm -hmm. hormones hormones i'm going to take them till the day i die or whatever i think that i get that somewhat because they're sort of saying look we know it's safe and it whether we like it or not it's the best treatment we have it is the best treatment Mm -hmm. But when they talk like that, they miss out a whole host of other women that can never take it. And that's just what essentially boils my pace. It drives me crazy. And I'm just like, say that, but then say, but don't worry if you can't take it because there's always other options. And there is. Yeah, it does make a group of people maybe feel like, okay, well, I guess I am hopeless. I guess I can't take that. And now I'm left out of the conversation. Yeah. So, oh, now I'm going to have diseases because yeah. what's happened is we know what hormone therapy can do and it's very clear what it can do. And then when other people say things like it prevents cardiovascular disease, it prevents dementia, uh, dementia, sorry, and all of these different things, that's not what it does. And that's not what yeah. the medical organizations are saying. And so when you hear that there's women like saying, well, oh my God, I'm going to get dementia now because I don't mm-hmm. have Um, I can't take hormone therapy. Well, actually, the data, like the most recent data from the International Menopause Society has a white paper, and it's to do with brain fog and hormone therapy. Mm. And there's a statement that's called the number that counts. And the number that counts is 2,000 women. um, If 2,000 women took hormone therapy for brain fog, only one would have the benefit. It's not indicated for that. 
Yeah. Right? So, so it's just really important to know that actual data exists. There's real experts studying this, but we don't need to oversell it because what it does is good, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you can't take it, it doesn't matter because there's still really good options out there, right? Yeah. But if yeah. you're doing any of those things, Pam, and you're not then going, all right, I got to take some ownership here. What do I need to do for myself? Right. Yes. This is your bread and butter, right? This is where you're sent to people. You got to move, even if it feels like you're not making progress. You mm -hmm. got to sort of take a quick look at your meals and just go, where are you, where are you falling off here? Where can you make some small adjustments that are going to add some benefit to you like the and you, managing your stress and mm. sleeping and all of those things right we know that they're the keystones of good health regardless mm -hmm. of what medication you take right mm -hmm. yeah so so that kind of gives us some actionable actionable steps that we because you still want to do those things um with medication and therapies or not you still want to do the lifestyle like you said it's it's better lifestyle is better than a lot of things. You still have to do those things along with your hormone therapy or whatever other medications that you and your doctor choose to help you through this um, or, you know, what have you. So you still have to move. So that gives you something to do. Um, but what happens when somebody gets so discouraged and they're just like you said they, they they're at that point where they just you know hormone therapy didn't work for me or i can't take it or my doctor thinks i can't and yeah. now i don't have any energy to do these things pam that you're telling me to do um they look so easy for you and you and i both know that they're not easy for anyone <laughs> but they they look easy for you or this is what you do for a living um you know so so where, where does that person fall? What can they do? Uh, you know, are there, you know, you said there might be some, is there supplements that they can try? Are there, you know, cause people are going to search everywhere. The supplement uh, industry is worth trillions of dollars. The yeah. menopause industry is worth trillions of dollars and um, sorry, $16 billion. I sh sorry, I meant to say. And the majority of that is made up of supplements. And most of those supplements don't have the evidence behind them. They don't. These companies yeah. don't run randomized controlled tests that are peer reviewed. They don't do any of that. Um, and a lot of time women are taking supplements because they're desperate. We see yeah. them. We've been yeah. there. We know what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, and they may feel better. Chances are it's a placebo effect, which can be 30 to 40 percent in some cases right mm -hmm. um but usually these proprietary type um combination supplements that have a bit of this and a bit of that they could be cross-contamination in their poor quality ingredients cheaper ingredients fillers you just don't know what's in them right yeah usually making false promises so i'm not somebody that actually is a fan of supplements unless it's something that you need and so I'll use myself as an example because I know. So I um, really struggle with seasonal affective disorder. And mm -hmm. when I had my blood work done, my vitamin D was zilch. It was terribly low. My iron was, my ferritin was very low. And so I have to supplement with iron tablets and vitamin D yeah. because my body needs them. But mm -hmm. much else, if I was to take a B complex vit vitamins, my B vitamins were through the roof. They were already really well stocked. All I'm yeah. doing is create an expensive P. Why would you take something unless you unless you needed it? Now, in menopause, there are some things that can be helpful to some mm -hmm. women. And I think that if we talk about some generalized things, magnesium might be helpful, right? Yeah. We know it's nice. It's calming, joint pain, not being able to sleep at night, all of these things. Melatonin might be helpful. Why not give it a go and see if it works? It, yeah, I... <laughs> Yeah. I take I take a magnesium and a melatonin at night, um, and I believe it works for me. Yeah. Right. Um, and then so I think just you just like be sensible about it. If it's costing you hundreds of dollars in supplements every month, then you need to sort of sit down and go. The reason you take supplements is where there's a gap in your diet or you're you are deficient in some way and that's why you need to take them. And I just think that's a better approach to supplements than just going. Janet's down the streets taking this happy mammoth and it's going to heal my hormones. Don't do that. Um, and then, and then, so for example, like if you've got, and, and I've been there and I'm pretty sure you've been there where you're just like, Oh, I'm supposed to do a workout today. 
and I've got nothing to give. Like I'm literally exhausted. I don't want to get up off the sofa. Um, I'm such a failure. I'm such a loser. And everybody else is doing push-up challenges and going for walks every day. And I hate them all. And I hate humans. And I hate my husband. And I hate my kids. Right? We've all been there, right? Um, <laughs> like, it's hard, right? And so, I mean, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because the best way to make any health improvements is emotional and behavioral change. Mm -hmm. We know this, yeah. right? It's how things stick. So how can even in your darkest days, how can you reframe something that looks different? Instead of saying, I'm such a loser, hate everyone. How about saying, what's one thing I can do today that might make me feel better and that I could consider to be a win? And yeah. so on those days where I had like nothing to give and I was very depressed, I made myself go outside for a 10 minute walk. I didn't care how miserable I was. And even if I came back home and I didn't feel completely uplifted, I definitely felt a, a tiny bit better than I did before I went out. And so look to do things that sort of stimulate something that creates joy. It might be meeting up with your mate for a coffee and going for a walk with them. Like it doesn't have to be groundbreaking. And I think that when somebody who isn't you know this isn't their area of expertise looks to make lifestyle changes they probably think everything has to be overhauled and they do these big changes that are unsustainable instead of going maybe I'll just change two things and see how I stick to that and it could be something like I'm going to commit to a 20 minute walk every day every day I don't care what the weather's like I'm going to dress well I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to eat more green vegetables like yeah. that they're great things or I'm going to improve my sleep hygiene I'm going to stop doom scrolling at midnight I'm going to turn my phone off an hour before bed have a nice chamomile tea and just mm. go and read a book I'm going to do that for two months and see if my sleep improves do yeah. things like that because you may not feel like you're taking strides forward but you're definitely moving in that direction you're definitely not taking step back and I think yeah. that that's the key yeah. Yeah. And I, I love what you talked about with the supplements is I, I think what I have found um, is, you know, you and I both have been in this industry for many, many years. And, uh, you know, and I think what I find is that people often buy these supplements, like you said, they're, they're out of desperation and, uh, and, and they get sold these on their pain points. And, um, yes, you exactly. know, and so they're like, yes, that's going to help me. Or they're like, you said, the person down the street is either selling the supplement or they just really believe in their heart that that supplement has changed their life. Um, but they buy these supplements and they think, okay, I did something for myself and they, and they, they feel like they're starting to gain a little control because they got this one thing that they think is going to change everything. And they put it on their shelf. And like you said, it's hundreds of dollars. Oftentimes supplements are not cheap. Um, and it sits there <laughs> yeah. all the time or they take it and it doesn't work. Um, but a lot of times it just sits there and they kind of don't know how to take it or they're just not. And they're just like, it, it, so it's a very expensive way of saying, you know, I did that for me when you're saying, you know, you should probably, I would say, get brilliant at the basics, cover your basics, write it down and do one or two things. And that's going to benefit you more than buying the supplement that your friend takes from down the road um, without really being deficient in that. Cause I'm like you, I, I live in Michigan, so we don't get the sun a lot in the winter time. Um, and I have to take vitamin D but I only take it when I get checked because I have found that I had had at one point really high levels of vitamin D because I was on the train to just take it. Cause I thought, well, everybody needs to take it. That's not actually the case. Uh, I will, I will take it only when my blood work shows that I yeah. need to take it. Exactly. Um, and so I think that like, it's, it's definitely the small is better approach to, to health changes, because the idea is, is that even in perimenopause, when you're very symptomatic, for example, and you really don't feel like anything you're doing is helping, yeah. I just would just say, like, look forward, because you know that it is helping if you continue to do it, because you're creating new positive you know, behaviors. We understand yeah. that menopause symptoms tend to get better mm -hmm. in postmenopause. And then you've already set yourself up for success because we're living longer. We need to live longer with real quality. We can't just be like 
getting older and and not enjoying our lives and so these things aren't things that are just going to be fleeting you're adding change to your life that will hopefully stick like yeah. learning to floss your teeth I'm British it's took me 20 years to remember to floss my teeth right but it's that type of thing like if you commit to doing something that's small and something that you actually enjoy as well right mm -hmm. chances mm -hmm. are you're going to be successful at, at it and then usually that sort of propels people to go well that was easy I might try and add something else and so that's yeah. to me the way forward and don't be so hard on yourself like it's so difficult to have a conversation with yourself and be upbeat um, yeah. when you're when you're feeling like that but really it, you wouldn't do that to anybody else you wouldn't be hard on anyone you would be kind and gracious yeah. so you need to be like that with yourself yeah no I, I agree with that I agree with that statement for sure I, re I remember times when I was very depressed a another time when my hormones weren't actually well when I just got off of competing and they were all I didn't actually have a menstrual cycle for eight years because I was just in this it was so bad but then we didn't have a lot of information then I was in my 20s nobody really cared and I went to doctors they were like well your bones are thinning but you know no big deal just take some stuff and it, it was a lot of misinformation then uh, however I remember that very depressed state um and it was hormonal I'm sure but I just remember thinking gosh I really feel lousy when I say something out loud about myself so I just stopped saying those things when they came to my head I just stopped saying them I just didn't give those words any life and then when I had children I I thought I would never want my kids to think this about themselves so I don't want to think that about me either and if they if I ever heard those words come out of their mouth, the things that I think about me, I would be devastated. Yeah. So I think I, I kind of had to, I had to flip that a little. So that's really um, a good point to bring up. I like, I like that. Yeah. And your kids listen to everything, everything. I never yeah. let them hear me. I never talk about my size, good or bad, or it's, it's indifferent. It doesn't matter. We never speak about it. Um, never speak about a body part unless we're saying, oh, you're so strong because you can do, you know, mm -hmm. your pull up or whatever they're doing, you know. Uh, but I, it really, I think that changed me for sure. Um, mm -hmm. However, I wanted to to kind of touch on one thing. Um, so you talked about the supplements, and so where where in your journey? And I know everybody's different, um, but you kind of had a, a little. You didn't like the the HRT. Uh, oh, real quick, what about testosterone? So you hear that sometimes. So women take testosterone. Is that kind of fall under the HRT? How does do you kind of you know anything about that? Yes, yeah, so I'll tell you what the medical guidelines are for testosterone. So whereas estrogen and progesterone fall in perimenopause, testosterone declines with age. So you just need to know that as you get older, your testosterone levels will get lower, right? And it's sort of all sorts that seems to meet at the end at this about the same time, around about 50, 55. Um, so estrogen um, is your hormone therapy. The progesterone is there to protect your uterus. It also can be super helpful for sleep issues as well, um, you know, and anxiety because it's a very common. So that's what your estrogen and progesterone do. Currently, testosterone is only indicated for low libido and nothing else. And often I'll hear women or doctors who actually sell it saying oh it's the missing piece of the puzzle um and it helps with brain health cognitive health and it there's been no data to support that mm. there is a doctor in Australia called Dr. Susan Davis, who is doing all of the testosterone research as we know it. And she hasn't found that to be a conclusive result in her findings to date. And so globally at testosterone um, is only indicated for low libido it might have some other ben other knock-on effects i mean usually like when something feels better other things feel better because our body yeah. doesn't work in a silo right um mm -hmm. how it's supposed to be issued to you is that you're supposed to try hormone therapy to start with get your levels established it's usually hormone therapy is a very low level of estrogen and progesterone it's not high levels but once you're feeling okay on that if you're still struggling with low libido Low, low desire, then you can be, um, you can request testosterone. Um, and testosterone um, regulated, um, there isn't a woman's um, preparation for this. You have to be given a male dose. It's actually mm. really terrible. And it's mm. very hard to manage because you put a micro doses on and there's no, but it, 
regardless you can, you potentially can get that from your doctor um if you have uber high doses of testosterone you could start getting things like you know like voice changes male pattern balding and acne yeah. and stuff and women get hairy chins and stuff like nanny mcphee and so you've got to really be careful about taking high doses and some women are taking testosterone pellets and they're not recommended by any medical organizations these are completely unregulated and they're ultra high doses like um levels of athletes were taking when they were taking wow. the performance enhancing drugs so women take them and feel really good because yeah you're on a steroid yeah. but, the, but the but the long-term impacts of that are not known and therefore it's not recommended um and so um if you do take testosterone though it doesn't matter if it's one of those teeny tiny doses you have to have your blood monitored the whole way through you mm. cannot have high levels of testosterone i actually did try it and um, when i tried some of my therapy and it sent me wild crazy it's a hot it's a very very powerful yeah. hormone and i would just say that so is estrogen and progesterone they're very they're drugs they're hormones yeah. they're powerful so yeah, you sound like me i'm very sensitive to everything it's like i can barely take anything and i notice yeah. everything um yeah, I, one, I, I, one of the indications for me and what might be helpful to other people is that I wondered why I couldn't until I spoke to a colleague of mine who is a, a menopause expert. And she said that, you know, in her clinical practice, if someone had a bad experience taking hormonal birth control pills, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't take that. It really wasn't good for me. Yeah. If you had a, a bad time during your pregnancy, which I did, I hated being pregnant. It was <laughs> awful. I was sick the whole way through. And as soon as those big nine half pound babies popped out, I was like, oh, I feel great again now. And I always, I always used to look at women who were pregnant going, will you stop saying how nice it is? Because I literally don't even want this baby. That's how awful it was. Um, yeah. And so they're indicators of like having higher levels of hormones and not oh, doing yeah. well on them. And so okay. I just thought that that, that was, sense. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was like that too. I think people say they, they love being pregnant. I was like, I have, do not love being pregnant. I don't know what your life is like without pregnancy, but mine was not fun. No, <laughs> not I a know. fun experience I for know. me. Yes. Um, so, okay, so that's helpful about the testosterone and no pellets, um, not really standing behind the pellets is what you're saying. And um, then what did you, before we kind of end this, what, where did you kind of see? So you went through all of that and you went through the ups and downs, you tried the, the, all of the things you found out an antidepressant kind of helped you through some of those times um along with your lifestyle modification stress stress management i noticed you talked a lot about honoring your body and resting and not pushing yourself like you were in 20s and 30s um making sure that you're getting something even if it's just a little bit it still matters where did you find that turn in feeling better um because i think that's what a lot of women when want. am i finally going to feel myself yeah, again like right? when, yeah i know everybody's experience is different but just totally. in your experience when did you finally start to feel that wow i'm i i can feel myself being more and more I, you know, I, I, it's going to be a hard question to answer, but I'm pretty sure you understand this after having depression. And 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 the reason I say that is because I'm using that as one symptom. You know, mm -hmm. with depression is you. You know, if you're someone who struggles with depression, and it and it comes on you, you often don't know you're depressed until you're in it, and it's heavy, yeah. and it's almost too far. But the little warning signs of like I'm starting to withdraw and not going out as much and I'm struggling to get out of bed you don't put two and two together and go oh my god I've got to get on top of this same with my migraines like I would have like a, a warning and I would ignore it and then I'd have this massive migraine that I could have handled if I'd have just paid attention but it was the same on the other side of it like coming out of it it was only I would say like a year like after I would like look back and go you know I haven't had a migraine for like six months, you know, I, I my mood has been great, and um, and I'm actually feeling less tired, and I'm ex and I'm back to exercise, and I'm back running again, and I'm feeling good about yeah. it. And so, but for me, the when, when I actually look at when that was, I would say I was about 50, 51, but I went into full menopause at forty eight. 
Mm -hmm. So you're talking two, three years after, and that sort of fits in with the statistics as well. You know, your yeah. hormones are still fluctuating as they decline, and then they do find a, a type of equilibrium. Your brain will do that rebound and regrow. You know, your your brain your brain starts to compensate in other ways, and so things just calm down. And um, on the other side, I'm meeting women and they're taking life by, you know, the horns and they're just going for it. They're, I love it. Like, and it yeah. gives me so much joy that when, you know, I know where I was, it is almost like being pregnant. I can't remember it that well now, <laughs> you know, yeah. but like I'm looking forward and I'm inspired by like older women, like leading the way in industry and, and, and like fitness with their families whatever I love it um and I I would just say to women that know that this isn't a cave it's a tunnel things will get better um and then look to these people like feel inspired by them don't judge yourself based on what they can do but just think to yourself you know I have the ability I've just got to like either be patient believe in myself and and all of those things but it, it isn't here to stay yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's super helpful and I think gives everybody, and that's really what I, I highly recommend everybody listen to your book or go on Amazon, buy your book. Um, it really, really, uh, again, it just felt like a warm hug and a pat on the back and a buddy to go through all of this with. Um, and you're the first to say like, I don't have all the answers, but I'm here to help you figure it out. And everything that I know I get to share. So um, that's kind of Amanda and who she is. And she shares stuff all the time. So if you haven't looked up her book, look up your book and it's Minapocalypse. Is that how you say that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so it, it's a great, it's, it's, it's fun to listen to. I think I've listened to it two and a half times now because uh, I go back to things and I like to listen to them again. And people who buy it, it's a dog ear book. You know, you don't have to read it in one because it's solution driven. I want women to feel like, oh, I should try that. Or I should mm -hmm. ask about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's good for every stage um, yes. too, because it has bits and pieces for wherever anybody is. Um, and it really does. I think you do an amazing job about um, just keeping it real, but also um, making us feel not alone. And to kind yeah. of, you, you say that you follow people that lead the way, like you're leading the way for a lot of us. So that's super fun and um, very cool and comforting. And you really just feel like a friend. Um, and and um, so, so I just wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you for that. I want to tell everybody that's listening to make sure you go and listen to her book, buy her book, uh, and join in the conversation. So you have, you have Instagram, um, you have a website. I know you have a, you have a newsletter. Um, yeah, but I'm really crap at sending it out, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not real good at that stuff either. As you know, I was supposed to send out a calendar and I'm real, not real organized, but, um, <laughs> you know, we try our, we try our best. Um, and, and the bottom underlying thing for you too, is, uh, that, you know, you get, you get the opportunity to take care of yourself and there's a multitude of ways to, that to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of the, the basics are the same for everybody. And then you just build upon, upon there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me on. I've really enjoyed our chat today. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to list all of Amanda's stuff up, so I don't even have to say it here. So, um, again, go give her a follow and thank you so much, Amanda. Take care. Bye-bye.